Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or if you are seated in the back row and you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button and setting your notification bell to all. That way you get reminded of every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you can buy me a coffee. And if you are interested in becoming a member of the channel, all that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, I have a very special announcement. A lot of people have asked me, why do you just like and heart my comment instead of replying? Um, I'm getting to the point where the channel is growing and I cannot respond to every single person's comment. So a like and a love, I did acknowledge what you wrote and I appreciate all of you all's kind words. So please forgive me if your comment did not receive a reply that you were anticipating. Also as well, yes, I do mispronunciate certain things and I'll use Google to sort of teach me how to say certain things. I know it's not all precisely the way you say things, but it's as close as you can get to trying to pronunciate it right. So please forgive me for my mistakes because I've gotten a lot of hate comments for it. All right. Now, with all of that out of the way, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. This happened a couple years ago when I was working at my childhood summer camp. I've certainly gotten strange feelings around the area before, but nothing especially malevolent or frightening. My coworker and I were taking our group for a sleep out up in some shelters about half a mile into the woods and away from the rest of the camp. I'm used to being in the woods and I generally don't scare easy, even at night. So when I woke up in the wee hours of the morning, I set out for the latrines without a second thought. I figured it was around 4 or 5 a.m. based on a red glow on the horizon. The light fell softly between the trees, illuminating the path and the color sides of the shelters. The walk was only a few hundred yards, but felt longer with only my flashlight. I was about halfway there before I heard something behind me. Again, I know these woods. I know what most of the animals in the area sound like, from the camp's horses to the local family of black bears. Whatever this was, it was huge. Its presence seemed to close in on me from all around, and I could hear twigs snapping, vines tearing, mud squelching underfoot. I am not fast, and I know that running on the uneven path in the dark wouldn't get me very far. So I walked. I walked like I owned those woods, slowly and deliberately, until I reached the light on the side of the latrine. The presence had faded. I was even starting to feel good and confident, like I could keep going, keep walking through the dark woods until I reached the sunrise. I had to tell myself to stop, to turn where I meant to turn. I eventually returned to my shelter and fell asleep. Maybe I would have forgotten about it if not for that sunrise. I'd watched so many sunrises over the lake, I should have known better. The red light in the woods wasn't in the east where it should have been. It was out by the western side of the pasture, blood red and a little too bright for what it was pretending to be. The more I think about it, the more it felt like I was being herded somewhere. I haven't met anyone with a similar experience, but my friends have theories from fairies to alien abduction. I'm not sure I believe that, but I'll never go to that part of the woods alone again. A 
I don't know why, but I recently started thinking about an event that happened roughly around 2013 to 2014, when I was about 14 years old. I have never experienced hallucinations in my life, and my family has neither. Back then, the Slender Man hype was at its peak, and of course I wanted to reenact the game with my brother. So I drew some figures, similar to the game, on some A4 paper sheets and went into the woods next to my residence. It was midday and my brother, two years younger than me, was fiddling with some sticks at the entrance of the woods. Meanwhile, I was nailing the sheets of paper to some trees. Even though it was sunny, I felt like this place had a weird vibe to it still to this day. So, dumb me continued nailing the papers to the trees, thinking that the atmosphere would make the game even better. About 15 to 20 minutes after, I started nailing the papers. I came upon an old fallen tree with its roots sticking out of the ground. As I passed it, I felt something strange going on. It wasn't a sound, just a feeling that I had to turn around. As I did exactly that, I saw an approximately two and a half meters tall figure, all black except its face, standing about four to five meters away from me. It had no facial features and just stood there watching me. The whole encounter lasted about two seconds before I turned back around, screamed at the top of my lungs, and bolted toward my brother's location. I was in total panic running like my life depended on it. I felt relieved when I saw my brother fiddling with some rocks on the side of the road. I tried explaining what happened to him, but he just thought I was messing with him. The game was canceled, and I made sure to stay by his side while taking off all the pictures I had nailed to the trees. I went back to the spot of the encounter with him, examined it clearly, trying to tell myself that I just saw an illusion or something, but nothing even remotely resembled that figure or was that black in that area. I kept this encounter mostly to myself and never talked about it anywhere, thinking everyone would just write it off as a troll post or a spooky story. My family are all heavily religious people, unlike me, who is an atheist. The whole thing happened in France, in the 92nd department. To this day, I still have no explanation as to what I saw. Maybe it was Slender Man. Maybe it was another similar entity. I didn't get a clear look at it since all my instincts were telling me to run. But I am sure that this thing really was there. Hello there everyone, I'm a major lover of the paranormal and spent a lot of time and effort in my life seeking out paranormal encounters and have become a seasoned occultist over the years through that passion. I have had numerous encounters in my life, both spiritual and tangible events of a paranormal nature. I've read all these stories posted for so long I decided it's time to share a few of them to contribute back to you all. I am going to detail these separate encounters that I've had when I lived with my parents. Their house was in a half-completed suburb, which was somehow permitted to be built by making it into a vast stretch of untouched state park in northeast Florida. The first story is the most unsettling for me. On our days off right after high school, my cousin and I would routinely drive my parents' golf cart around the neighborhood and into the back of the large neighborhood because it was abandoned and completely overgrown. We knew all the abandoned construction trails through the forest and where they meet back up on the roads that were completely unbothered by any suburban houses. It was broad daylight, probably around 2 or 3 p.m., and we had parked the golf cart coming off of a trail and towards the concrete roads into the back part of the neighborhood. The grass on the unused lots were covered in weeds 
and grass that was probably five or six feet off the ground. We unleash the pipe. We take a few hits. All is peaceful. The birds are singing. The air is clear. He takes another hit and passes it to me. I start to light the bowl, and before I take another hit, I hear my cousin say my name twice. Very seriously. I panic and think the cops have just pulled up or something. I look at him, and he's staring straight ahead, shocked, and just says in a low voice, What the fuck is that, cuz? I look up and down the road, and I see it. It's a little man peering out from the grass on the left side of the road, about 20 feet away. It looks like he is a naked humanoid completely covered in mud and crouched down as low as a person can go while still being mobile. It's not human, but it is human-shaped. With both of us staring at this creature, he backs up slightly and then, it still disturbs me to remember this, Rody runs faster than humanly possible across the concrete road and into the grass on the other side. It was like a human moving as fast as an insect does when it panics. Imagine crouching down as far as you can go without falling over and then sprinting. This thing appeared to do just that. No words needed. I disengage the parking brake and gas it. We drive all the way to the front of the neighborhood to the community center, area probably a mile away, and decide we should probably just go home. Lots of frustrated, what the fuck was that? Followed because there was no rational explanation at all. We still talk about that story all the time. Funnily enough, about a year ago, my parents moved to a bigger house, about a hundred feet from where this happened, once the neighborhood started building back there again. The second story must have been about six or seven years ago, maybe a year or two after the first story. Very general timeline, but you get the idea. I was hanging out with a friend and his girlfriend, as well as his weed dealer, which was a guy I had known for a long time also. I had stopped smoking weed by then, but everyone was good company, and I would have a few beers while they did their thing. After a while, it became apparent that we would have to give the dealer a ride back, and we decided that we would all go together and could just take my car. So we did. It must have been somewhere around 9 or 10 in the evening. The dealer's house is a straight shot down a main road for about 15 minutes. We get on to the main road through the city and everything is completely normal for a while. We are almost to the neighborhood and suddenly, police lights. Holy fuck. We pull over into a well-lit gas station right in the middle, and the whole routine unfolds. The officer accused me of pulling out in front of somebody trying to make a right turn, despite us having all green lights and riding in the middle of a three-lane road. His reason for pulling us over was soon incomprehensible, but he ended up recognizing the guy in the front seat, the dealer who fortunately didn't have anything on him. So cut to waiting around in three more cop cars and the drug-sniffing dog. Of course, the dog hits off on nothing, and we get the whole kit and caboodle of stepping out while they search the car. Here's where the fun starts, because they begin pulling out a lot of my occult stuff, like an athame and wooden chestfuls of sigils and candles and some other mobile all-purpose stuff. <laughs> what are you guys, some kind of devil worshippers? I roll my eyes. I open the trunk for them. Nothing in there but a black robe and Ouija board that I've used for years. Of course, they take them both out and wave it around to make fun of it. All some more. The encounter ends without any great dramatization because they, expectantly, found nothing. I loathed that they had tossed around all of my tools, but I'm a pretty level-headed practitioner. We drive the dealer to his house and part ways and head back to my friend's house to mess around and have a few more beers. I head home at around 2 or 3 and go to bed. 
Let me forewarn you that I have never had sleep paralysis or apnea. I don't dream particularly all that often or spectacularly, and I cannot recall a single instant of experiencing a hallucination in my life. So, when I see things, I know there's more to it. I don't wake up. I'm still asleep. I feel like my spirit is brought to the surface of a deep water. I open my eyes and sit up, but I cannot see. There is a really weird noise, a rhythmic whooshing that is bringing me to wakefulness. My vision slowly expands outward from the center with a blue thing, very unusual. I immediately become aware of the fact that I am not alone, and I look into the room that expands out to the foot of my bed. It glows blue because of the moonlight coming in from the windows at the opposite end. A few feet out from the foot of my bed is a high-top round table with two high-top stools on the other side. I can hardly see it, though, because there's a perfectly silhouetted goat man looking being, perhaps seven feet tall and very wide, sitting on the high-top stool closest to me and facing my direction. He has moose-like horns and is the source of the whooshing as he is breathing very heavily, just like a runner after a hard run. I cannot see his features, but he is obviously looking right at me, and I'm looking at him. I blink. I am experiencing sleep paralysis, I think. I blink more. I become very afraid that there is really a seven-foot-tall goat man sitting in my bedroom as this is not a usual predicament that I have to face. I probably stared for about 10 seconds before I get hit with a sort of communicated feeling that the being had just come from doing something very awful to some people. One person in particular and then rushed here to alert me of it. The breathing slows a little after another 10 seconds, and the being moves to get off the stool, the table behind him shifting and cracking as it does so. As soon as he hits the ground, he just fades out. I am left baffled. I'm afraid, but I'm also relieved. I get up and turn on the lights, walk around the house, and everything is effectively normal. I sit and think about what the hell I just saw, and the police incident didn't even connect in my head for probably five or ten minutes. I go out for a smoke to observe the lake out back and the sky because the moon is bright and beautiful. It might have been a full moon, but I can't really remember. I calm down and go back to bed, having been relieved by connection of events that I made. I don't remember what time this happened because I never looked, but it seemed like the middle of the night. I never had any further happenings in the vein of this experience, or seeing anything in the night, and I've never seen the being again. The last story wasn't super long after the Guardian of the Ouija board, probably less than a year. I worked at a movie theater during this whole time period and I had taken to jogging at like 2 or 3 a.m. after work. Perfectly serene, safe, and there was never anybody awake or driving around. The house was on a small triangle-shaped configuration of roads, situated around a lake with only one road going through the forest to get back to the main neighborhood. The road out was on the other side of the lake from where I was. Anyways... I come out of the garage and start walking down the road and shortly come to the first right turn. The orange of the street lamps keeps the road pretty decently lit, but the orange lamps cast a spooky feeling. As I round the corner on the sidewalk, I see another jogger down the way on the other side of the road. I think about how odd it is to see another jogger at this time of night, so I slow down and kind of stare. It occurs very quickly that this is not another jogger, because most joggers are not eight feet tall, ghostly 
shadow beings, taking six-foot steps. Due to the confusion, I don't even feel anything as I watch this tall, lanky shadow being run all the way down the road right in front of me and in between two houses and then into the woods. He made absolutely no sound at all. As he passed right in front of me down the middle of the road, I saw that where his hands and feet should be, there was nothing but a fade to mist. Otherwise, he was just a three-dimensional absence of light. After seeing that and taking a moment to process, I decided that if an interdimensional shadow being was running at full sprint away from something, I probably should do the same. So I turned around and noped out of there and back to my garage to sit in existential terror. After about 30 minutes, I decided that I was going to conquer my fear and run around the triangle like I intended to before having a paranormal incident. I succeeded, terrified, and luckily nothing happened on that attempt. Anyways, these are my stories from my parents' neighborhood. I'm not sure if these sightings of beings have any relation to the forest, but I have a strong feeling that it does in some way. I'm an occultist, sure, but stories of this nature are far different in substance than seeing unexplained beings unprovoked. And still to this day, I cannot figure out what those beings were. The summer of 2008 was a rough time to graduate from college. I had just been four years getting a degree only to find that the job market had all but dried up. As bummed out as I was about being unemployed for the foreseeable future, I found a deep appreciation for backcountry camping and hiking that summer. Growing up in the Rocky Mountains and graduating from a college in western Montana, I was not a stranger to hiking or camping. But that summer, it became an escape to the point of an obsession. Going on daily hikes and camping beneath the stars really helped my mental health while I worried about my life's purpose and my future. It was June and unseasonably cold, wet, and cloudy. The daytime highs barely touched 50 degrees, and at night it dropped well below freezing. Despite the weather, I had planned to hike around the Anaconda Range that week, and I wasn't going to let that deter me. My plan for the week, funny enough, was to hike from Storm Lake over Storm Lake Pass and down to Upper Seymour Lake. Storm Lake is a challenge to get to and requires a 4x4 pickup and some skilled driving. The road is a narrow, two-track winding its way through thick pine forests. The way was slick with rain, but I made it to the top with little heartburn. I set up camp on the north shore of the lake and decided to do some fishing. The fishing was miserable. It was cold and nothing was biting. But the best thing about bad fishing is what my thoughts were free to wonder while I sat there on the shore. The rain was a constant light drizzle and created a natural white noise. Time passed and my daydreams were cut short as a low rumble from up the canyon overtook the sounds of the rain. The rumbling was not unlike a distant diesel engine. There are no roads that go beyond where I was camped. No machinery or vehicles could be up that canyon. Maybe it's a plane, I thought, looking up in the rain clouds. But the sound wasn't getting closer or further away, and the sound wasn't above me. It came from beyond the lake and up into the canyon. The sound was stationary and constant. This was most certainly not a plane or a truck or a bulldozer. All of this wasn't outright scary, but nonetheless, my hair stood on end while I sat there listening. About 20 minutes, the rumbling faded away, and I was left with only the sound of raindrops. 
Soon enough, I caught a decent-sized trout, cleaned it, and headed back to camp to get ready for dinner. The fish cooked up fine, but to be honest, I hate trout. It's edible, sure, but totally unappetizing. They taste like mud. I ate as much as I could stand and tossed the rest into the lake. Building up my fire for the night, I set back to enjoy the evening with a bit of whiskey. Night came fast. The mountain ridges put the sun to bed early, and the rain clouds obscured the starlight. It was dark. Really dark. The sounds of crackling warm fire and the rain bouncing off of my tent were a great comfort and starting to lull me to sleep. I reminded myself I needed to build up the fire before bed. I walked over to my pile of scavenged firewood and grabbed an armful. Being away from the fire's crackling, I could pick up that all too familiar rumbling rising in the background. It was growing louder than before and closer. I may have had a few too many pools of whiskey and was tired and grouchy. This noise was ruining my camping trip and my buzz. Frustrated, I yelled into the blackness of the night. Hey, shut the fuck up, asshole. Like a switch being flipped, the rumbling stopped. And so did the rain. My heart skipped a beat. I realized that was not a convenient coincidence. There was an intelligence out there. Something sentient, observing me and responding to my screams, and I wasn't getting the most positive vibe from it. I threw all of my logs on the fire and retreated back to my tent. More on edge than ever, I just sat there listening, listening to the fire crackling, to my rapid breathing, and beyond that, to the silence of the darkness. Before this moment, I felt alone but safe. Now I felt alone and vulnerable. Beyond where the fire light faded, I felt were a million eyes in that dark watching me. My paranoia began to subside when the rain suddenly started again. Not a drizzle, but a massive downpour. I was glad I had built up the fire, or it would have been snuffed out for sure. My tent was being pushed down by the force of the storm. I thought about bailing to the truck, but knew I'd be soaked to the bone instantly. Risking injury or death over getting wet is the kind of logic only whiskey can produce. I could feel the rainwater pooling and moving under my tent. This storm was not letting up. The urge to get into the pickup truck and drive away was ever more tantalizing. I could get my stuff tomorrow in the daylight and spend a few nights in town, but I had had too much to drink. Driving, especially on that slick, muddy two-track road, would have been a death sentence, but I still needed a safer place to sleep other than a wimpy tent. Grabbing what I could, ripped open the tent flaps and ran for the truck. I was soaking wet by the time I settled into the driver's seat and locked the doors. Turning the heat on full blast, I hoped that would drive me out. It was going to be a miserable night, though. I reclined my chair and tried to calm my thoughts with deep breaths. The rain was not letting up. I was warm from the heater, and I was riding the crest of a good whiskey buzz. The fire was still raging despite the rain, and kept the campsite well lit. I remember the truck's clock reading 1.06 a.m. I blinked. It was only a moment, but when I opened my eyes, the rain had stopped. It was foggy and quiet. The once raging campfire was just embers by now, and there was morning twilight to the east. The truck's clock now read 5.45 a.m. It was morning. That couldn't be right. Almost five hours gone in the blink of an eye? I must have passed out. My head was killing me. I didn't think I had drank that much to justify that kind of hangover. I turned off the truck and stepped out to survey the night's damage. The tent was completely flattened. 
The tent poles were shattered to pieces. Everything was soaking wet. Smothering the remains of the fire, I dragged all my junk to the pickup and tossed it into the bed. My hike over the pass wasn't happening today. That was for sure. It was around 6.30 a.m. before I finished packing up camp. As I climbed into the cab of my truck, I heard the rumbling again through the morning fog. I drove out of there as fast as I could down that muddy, bobsled track of a road, not once looking into the rearview mirror. I have never been back to Storm Lake, and I probably never will. This all took place in the salt marshes, just off very populated areas. When I was six, my family owned a fair bit of land around one of the most popular springs in the area. As long as my mom or dad came with me, I was free to trot off into the woods. Well, one day, my dad is home and off we go to fuck about. Mostly I just run around burning off little kid energy. And that's just what I'm doing. The trees weren't dense, probably about 10 feet between them. But there's a lot of trees, a lot of dead leaves covering the ground, and that haze you get whenever you're deep in the woods. Well, I wind up lost. I'm somewhere on our land I don't recognize. There's trees and leaves far as the eye can see, and the ground is littered in old, rusted wheels a bed frame, and other various garbage in no particular order, and it had to have been there a while. Being six years old, I do the logical thing and freak out, started to cry and screaming for my dad. After a minute of this, I hear him shout, Hold on, don't move. Just keep crying, I'm on the way. A few seconds pass, I'm still shouting, and then I hear him say from what I think is a different direction. I'm right over here. Follow my voice. A few seconds later, almost there. Just hold on. And then again, a few seconds later, I'm right over here. Just come here. This goes on for about a minute, and I break down even more because to me, he's telling me two separate things, and I just curl up and cry. He linebackers his way into view, grabs me by the arm, and pulls me up. I'm not hurried away or anything. He just calms me down a bit, and then we walk off. I tell him he shouldn't have kept telling me to come to him after saying to stay there, and he tells me he never did say that, and that if you're lost in the woods near someone else, the best thing to do is stay put so they can find you. It was never brought up again. When I was in middle school, I was friends with a kid who had an unusual house. For starters, it had a basement. This is effectively considered a bad move in the state of Florida. Weirder yet, cell phones didn't work inside his house. At all. And the second you step outside to his front porch or side porch, boom, all your signal is back. Anywhere outside, the signal is back. But his place was cool and it was built next to an old, dried up riverbed. It was super fun to play on it, since it was all his parents' property. Naturally, we stayed friends through high school, and his place became the de facto hangout spot for the majority of us, despite the cell phone weirdness thing. It got significantly creepier, however, once the red eyes started appearing. I have to pause here and fill in this was after the breakthrough of the smartphone, but before apps were commonplace on them, and this meant there was no flashlight app or anything like that. Angry Birds didn't exist and the attached keyboard was the newest craze. You see, his house was literally a couple hundred feet from a major highway, but through just enough trees to dampen the noise of most vehicles. And when most of us had our licenses and started to spend erratic weekends there, the red eyes showed up. They were easily described. 
two evenly spaced, small crimson colored lights that would just appear on the property, often just on the other side of the fence where we parked and the very edge of where his floodlights reached. They would linger for a few seconds, abruptly go out, and then appear somewhere else, usually 10 or so feet away, maybe at a different height, and they would do this for an apparently random amount of time and eventually just disappear. They were bright enough that once I decided on the spot I was going home in the morning because I got to his front door and saw them staring at the house through the windshield of my car. They made everyone that saw them nervous and fearful. A couple of my buddies barely went out at night to try and find out what it was. I did not go with them, but there were four of them. Probably half an hour later, me and someone else were sitting on the porch getting some fresh air and drinking sodas when they came screaming out of the woods and rather than take the set of gates, just jumped the fence immediately. What I was told was that they just got out of sight of the house and been sweeping the area when as a group, they felt suddenly watched. They heard something rustling through the leaves and a bamboo cluster began to rattle. They swept the light over the area around them to try and see something, but nothing showed up. Suddenly, part of the cluster just bent and broke, so they hightailed it out of there. They finished relaying the story and, of course, we're calling bullshit on them before the guy sitting with me gets us to look out into the woods. There, burning brightly, is that same damned pair of crimson eyes staring at the house. And then they blink out and come back on, heading towards the gates. Naturally, we fuck off back inside. We still don't know what caused them, and as a collective, we've seen them probably around a hundred times on and off, with different groups of people, so the makeup of people was never quite the same. His dad was adamant it was taillights from the road that went through those woods, but we didn't really buy that because we've been to the road. It's a bridge over the gap where the river used to be, and to easily get there, you have to follow the riverbed because the trees and vines are denser than it's worth going around them. Even then, it's a 20-ish minute hike to a large fence, the height of the bridge you have to scale, and another couple hundred feet to the bridge itself. There's no fucking way you'd ever see the light of anything that far out, and even if you did, it would be on and off flickering. That's not what we saw. The closest answer I've gotten is an obscure Floridian spirit known as the Red Eyes or Old Red Eye, depending on the tale. Although the details are pretty fuddled and it's considered something that was made up recently, the story, depending on the title, goes that the lights are the eyes of a spirit that was either a Native American, the Red Eyes, or an escaped slave and conductor along the Underground Railroad, Old Red Eyes. They were tasked with helping others of their kind escape, Trail of Tears and Slavery, and were a sort of lookout to hostile patrolmen in that area, and were, if they encountered them, supposed to lure them away or scare them off the trail that was to be used. A last ditch effort was to kill them, if necessary. Needless to say, the ghost was one of these people that died during their duty and now haunt the area they died in. And if you don't give them the password or safe word or gesture, what have you, they get even more and more aggressive until eventually they have no choice left but to kill you. It was early spring 2016. I had just turned 24 years of age. My friend and I reached our main spot to camp. Black Canyon Rim Campground, just outside of Payson, Arizona. We'd usually travel out there two to three times a year. 
It has some incredible views and is only a couple hours away from the city. For the most part, the area was pretty secluded. A privately owned convenience store rested a few miles away, with a small town 20 miles before that. The entrance was on a dirt road directly off the highway, with a campground sign at the start of the road, marking local wildlife, any fire hazards, and general news relevant to camping folk. The path is mostly linear, with maybe one fork spanning several miles. We once traveled down the dirt road to see how far it would take us. One of the paths would take you to another highway entrance, with the ranger's tower halfway there. The other path led to a dead end. An abandoned cabin can be found on this path. A few miles in, mostly hidden off in the distance behind some larger foliage. The snow had mostly cleared up at this point, leaving for crisp air, a slight chill, and fauna becoming active again. We'd usually spot some wild horses, several deer, and tons of little critters whenever we'd come out this way. It really was the perfect time of year for a relaxing trip to get away from the city for a few days. We got in at around 4 p.m. on a Tuesday. It was late for us, as we usually try to make it out there by noon at the latest. This trip was pretty spontaneous. We both had work during the coming weekend and decided to just go for it. The sun was setting fast, and we still hadn't picked out our spot to camp. There were maybe two other groups, both families, parked somewhat close to the entrance, only a few hundred yards away from the highway. This time around, we just wanted to get away from humans for a while. Customer service jobs will do that to you. We drove down the dirt road, past our usual spot, and finally picked the perfect area. A small clearing just hanging off the edge of a hill. The whole valley could be seen from this area with a beautiful sunset. This would have been our main spot from then on, if the next night's incident never happened, that is. We agreed to get a campfire going and would just avoid building a tent this trip. We didn't have much time to do so anyway, and her car wasn't that uncomfortable. I'd sleep in the back seat and she'd take the passenger seat, with the window slightly ajar, we'd have a few blankets for each of us and would fall into that unrivaled slumber. The next day went fairly uneventful. We just decompressed. I had the strange feeling throughout the day, though, like we were being watched. There were crunching of leaves just out of sight every few hours, but I figured it was just local wildlife doing their thing. My friend didn't notice anything unusual, so... I didn't dwell on it. Night came and the feeling still hadn't gone away. My friend must have felt something she didn't vocalize, though. She took some of her sleeping pills. She didn't usually need to take them on our camping trips. The nature's ambience was enough to put anyone to sleep, I thought. It was nearing 1 a.m. My friend dozed off into the passenger seat while I attempted to wind down in the back. I leaned against the side window, behind the passenger seat, legs outstretched to the car's back door. The window opposite of me was rolled down slightly with a cool breeze flowing in. I had been on the phone scrolling through Facebook or whatever when I noticed something outside. A few crunches of the falling leaves, several paces outside the car. I whispered to my friend, did you hear that? But she was already out. I put my phone down and listened intently for a minute or two. Nothing. It must have been a small animal, curious of the camp. I went back to my phone, scrolling through social media. About ten minutes had passed when I heard it again. Crunch. Right outside the door. I lowered my phone. My eyes took a moment to adjust from the light of the phone into the deep dark of the woods. As I turned the phone away from me, the backlight illuminated the window above my feet. To this day, 
I cannot get the image out of my head. Two dirty, scabbed hands held onto the window. The fingers wrapped inside the car. The nails were long, unkempt, and dark. Behind the window, a silhouette of a face was pressed up against it. The breath would create condensation every few seconds. All I could make out were the reflections of those empty black eyes. I couldn't move. I could not scream. It felt like eternity. The staring contest between me and this thing. Thoughts were repeating incessantly in my head. Why haven't they ran away when they saw I noticed them? What were they planning? Is this the face of death? After probably ten seconds of doing nothing, the hand slowly unclenched the window and receded into the darkness. The condensation on the window dispersed. Another couple seconds passed before I heard the dreaded crunch, 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 melodically fading into the distance. I, still, just sat there. What in the fuck just happened? Why didn't I do anything? Why am I still not doing anything? With that thought, my body shot into adrenaline. I pounded on my friend's seat, waking her up from slumber into a dizzy confusion. I unlatched and kicked open the back door and took a moment to scan the area. Whoever they were, whatever they were, it was gone. I scrambled to pick up any important camping supplies we left outside and just crammed everything into the back seat and trunk, periodically looking over my shoulder, listening for those footsteps. I slammed the back door shut, and there they were, a grim reminder of the horror that had just happened. Two handprints imprinted on the window. I quickly wiped them off the window in a panic, a reaction to erase the event, I guess. I jumped into the front seat, started the car, and floored it out of there. My friend, finally coming to, asked me what in the hell I was doing. We gotta go, I said. There's someone out there. I didn't see whatever or whoever it was while fleeing the scene. Speeding down the dirt road, my friend insisted I slow down and I eventually did. We reached the highway, and I proceeded to drive 20 or so miles before we reached the Denny's, where my friend asked for us to stop, to eat, and explain everything. The nightmares subsided a few months later. My embarrassment continues to this day for the state of shock I was in at the time. Everybody says you either have a fight or flight instinct, and I'm confused whether I have either. I mean, I just sat there and did nothing. I frequently tend to ask myself, who was out there? Another camper messing with us? A resident of the abandoned cabin down the dirt road? Or maybe something more paranormal residing in the forest, watching lone, vulnerable campers as they drift off to dreamland? We'd still go camping there in the years ahead, but never too far from the highway. Whatever it was, I hope that was the last I had seen of it. Okay, I've been getting more acclimated to camping as a solo female. I'm pretty comfortable in the woods for the most part. I feel safe and at home. This was my first time solo camping in this area I'm from, so it felt particularly special. Pretty rugged, remote part of WNC camped off a gravel road, right by the creek. After having dinner by the fire, I settled into my tent, the air of early spring growing colder. As I'm trying to get cozy and drift off, I hear what I can only describe as a woman singing. I'm a skeptic and know our ears can play tricks on us. I've definitely heard things before 
when there's a monotonous sound like the river, but I tried to brush it off. But it had range. It wasn't consistent at all, as if there was a tune to it. At this point, I froze, holding my breath. The singing sound would stop and then start again. I was terrified, honestly. Eventually, I had to suck it up and go pee. The moon was full so I could see. Nothing there at all. Just the beautiful creek in the night. I continued to hear it for a little while longer before a very poor sleep. That's all. Nothing crazy. But I just know what I heard, and I don't have an explanation. Spirit in the river, perhaps? Yeah, spooky as shit. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true backwoods creepy stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Nat Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for your continued support of the channel. For without you, there would not be a me or this channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourself and also stay safe. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.